Howdy everybody. Welcome once again to RockFreakinSolid.com. This week's project is going to be making the side blown transverse flute. Okay. Um, <clears throat> today's Wednesday where we talk about uh, certain design specs, um, design concepts, and materials. First let's go over materials. If you're going to use wood, I highly recommend that you do this. Instead of trying to um, take a long drill bit and trying to drill a straight hole through a length of wood, do it like how you make Native American flutes. Okay? This is how we've been doing it for centuries. Okay? You split the wood in half and you channel it out. Okay? If you're going to use a router or a hammering gouge, whatever, channel out the halves lengthwise. And put it back together, glue it up. You know, if you're going to use tree sap or glue, whatever, clamp it tight, and there you go. And you can pretty much round off the, you know, shape the wood as you would. Now, I'm going to be showing you on bamboo. You don't have to use bamboo. You can use wood. You can use a cardboard tube if you really must. Um, if you can find bamboo and want to use it, go for it. It's pretty much already hollowed out. It's uh, got these little nodes here and there, so if you cut one end, you've got an open end and a closed end, you're golden. All right. Uh, one really super cool um, material I highly recommend, and this is good if you want to make professionally tuned instruments and sell them really cheap or expensive, uh, or if you're just starting out and you want to get the feel for this. Instead of making all your mistakes on expensive coca bolo wood or walnut or teak, whatever, make your mistakes on 25 to 35 cent pieces of PVC plastic pipe. Yeah? Now, the beauty of this stuff is, is, is manifold, okay? It's inexpensive. It's uniformly made. There's almost, you'll, you'll have almost no differences between identical flutes you make out of this stuff, okay? Wood's a little different, you know, there's little densities and non-densities here and there with knots and no knots and grains of wood and stuff like that. Uh, bamboo is the same, you know, it'll be, it'll be like wider on one end and thinner on, the, on another. This is all uniform, okay? Many professional people play on PVC instruments. It's even said that uh, R. R. Carlos Nakai, did I say that right? Uh, the Native American flute player, famous guy, uh, records on a PVC instrument. Why? Well, with wood, depending on temperature or, you know, uh, humidity or whatever, sounds can change a little. You need to, like, retune things. This stuff doesn't really move that much, okay? It's plastic. It's stuck there, okay? It's, it's never been alive. It's not living now. Well, I suppose a few bazillion years ago, this used to be tree sap or something. I don't know. Um, and the uh, material is just so solid, it sounds like you're blowing through glass. There's not really an edge on here, I'm just blowing across. See, there you go. It's, uh, you get a good sound out of it. It's cheap, again. Uh, you can make all the mistakes you want on it, and if you totally screw it up, you're out what? 25 cents? Build another one, you know? Um, excellent, excellent source of practice material to work on. Now, uh, all right, now let's get into a little bit more about design concepts here. Uh, last Monday we talked about um, the mathematical formula for figuring out the wavelength in inches or centimeters of any specific note. And that's how we found out how to make a flute. Uh, how long to make it. Um, an open-ended flute is about a half wavelength long, okay? But there's also other things to think about, such as the bore diameter. Figure about a half wavelength minus also about a third of the bore diameter, and that's pretty much how long it needs to be for that note that you're looking for. Then figure out the next uh, wavelength to find out where to put the finger hole and the next finger hole according to what notes you want these finger holes to be. And remember, these videos um, 
If you find that they're lacking in information, they're just pretty much summaries. If you want more information, uh, there's a lot more information in the text of today's post on the blog that you'll see this video in as well. Um, there'll be a link to today's post in the video description. Check it out. Come on over. Give us a visit. Us. Me. Give me a visit and check out the information, okay? Um, but as far as um, flute mechanics, as far as what goes on inside, okay? A little bit of physics, that's what I meant to say. Um, picture this. When you blow it across the edge, a lot of people think that the airstream is being split on that edge like this and that's how you get sound no okay what's happening is that the airstream is flipping in and out of the, the flute when you're blowing across the edge it's not really splitting it's switching between being blown out and in and out and in and out and in and inside the flute the reason for this is you work, you're dealing with an enclosed column of air okay when you're blowing into it you're pushing air into it faster than it can evacuate out the other end so you're creating compression okay now once that once it starts being pushed out and finally catches up with itself it goes out faster and it creates a little bit of a vacuum okay there's compression and vacuum and compression and vacuum and when it's being vacuum uh, in a vacuum state inside the tube for that millisecond that's when the breath gets sucked into the flute okay and then once that fills up so fast this compression that's when your breath is being pushed out of the flute and that's when it creates a vacuum and then it's like see you're in again see what i'm saying it just goes back and forth and back and forth and that quivering vibration over the edge of the, of the flute and blowing the air in and the way it comes out the end and out the finger holes and everything that's where you get the uh, frequency motion, the vibration to create the sounds, okay? That's the physics of how the air behaves inside of an enclosed column of air in a, in a, flute, in a woodwind instrument, okay? Um, now, because of all that going on in here, there's a lot of inertial stuff happening. When you're doing different notes, um, the compressions and vacuums happen in little packets here and there. Like, there'll be a compression and a, uh, expansion here. If you go an octave higher, it'll double. You'll have two areas where there's compression and expansion, okay? If you hit like a third or a fifth, there'll be like a few of them. In between each of those packets are what are called nodes, nodes and anti-nodes. Uh, it gets a little technical. Come to the blog post, I'll tell you more. But um, to make a long story short, um, all this friction that's going on, all this inertia, if it's too long for how wide it is, you're going to get a little interference. There'll be tone dampening. You're not going to be able to get the notes that you want. So um, there should be a ratio between the bore diameter and the bore length. And there's different ratios for different types of flutes. There's a different ratio for making Native American flutes. There's a different one for making Japanese shakuhachi. There's a different one for making this type. For this type, you want the bore ratio to be something like uh, 26 to 1, 28 to 1. Uh, make it simpler. Let's pretend this bore diameter, the inside diameter, is an inch. It's not, okay, but let's just pretend. If this was an inch, you'd want the uh, wide. You'd want the length to be somewhere between 26 to 28 inches long, okay? I pretty much want to stay within that window and that way you'll be able to play all the notes the fundamental and all the above ones and you'll have a better time uh, getting into the next octave when you overblow into the next octave all right okay um, I think that's pretty much it for now if you want more information come on over and visit okay come on over to rockfreakinsolid.com and read the text okay get some education going on this Friday we'll be making the flute all right Thanks for stopping by. See you Friday.